All right, let's move on to the notion of a coupler, or more specifically, what's called a directional coupler. So remember, in the previous lectures, we explored a three-port network. Uh, and we found that we could not have all three conditions sam uh, satisfied simultaneously. Let us say we could not match it. It could not, or it could be matched, reciprocal, and lossless, but not all simultaneously at once. You could pick two, but you couldn't have all three at the same time. So what we're going to do now is look at a generic four-port network here, which I've written out the S matrix here, and we've imposed the condition of being matched. So all of the diagonals here are zero. We've imposed the condition of being reciprocal. So all the transpose or off-diagonal elements equal each other. And then we're going to see what happens if I try to impose the condition of being lossless. Okay, so when you, when you uh, remember being lossless uh, required that S transpose times S conjugate, so this, this matrix had to equal uh, the identity matrix. Okay, so if you sort of write out that whole system of equations and impose uh, conservation of energy, you get 10 equations here. <laughs> so you notice these are all the conservations of energy here, right? So if I excite, say, port number one, then the energy coming out of the other three ports must all add up to that uh, excitation energy. And same for all of these other ports here as well. And then you had to impose this condition of all these off diagonal terms had to uh, satisfy these weird uh, conjugate conditions as well. So uh, ignore that little smudge there. There should be a conjugate on that term. Okay, so that is uh, six of these equations and then four of these all have to be sa uh, satisfied simultaneously in order to have a lossless network here on top of being the matched and reciprocal as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some mathematical derivations using this as kind of our foundation and just sort of see what happens. Is, is it allowed? Is there a result that I'm allowed to have? Or will I get another contradiction? Let's find out. Okay, let's do some intense mathematical <laughs> labor here. So this is going to get a little hectic. So try and keep up a little bit here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these two equations here and we're just going to write them down like so. So I got S13 conjugate S23 plus, oops, excuse me, uh, S14 conjugate S24. And I'm going to multiply this guy here by uh, S24 conjugate. That is equal to zero. Okay, and then I'm going to do a similar thing for the second equation. S14 conjugate S13 plus S24 conjugate S23. And I'm going to multiply this equation by S13 conjugate, and that is also going to equal zero. So you notice what happens if I distribute, something interesting will happen here. So let's just uh, write this guy out here. So I'll get an S13 conjugate S23 S24 conjugate, and then I'm going to get a plus S14 times the magnitude of S24 squared. I'm sorry, that's a conjugate there, equals zero. And then we'll do the same thing down here. We'll just distribute, and I will get S14 conjugate times S13, magnitude of S13 squared, oops, excuse me, and then plus these three terms here, plus S13 conjugate times S23. So you notice I'm reordering a bit. And I'll get an S24 conjugate is equal to zero. So you see how this choice of multiplication made something interesting happen. And that is these two terms now match. So if I subtract this equation from this equation, or vice versa, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> you get the following. I get S14 conjugate times the quantity of S13 magnitude squared uh, minus S24 magnitude squared, or vice versa. In fact, if you look at the book, uh, they did this convention here. Okay, so, and that is now equal to zero. So you'll see that gives you two options. Either this term here must be zero, or this little difference here must be zero. That is, these two terms must be identical. So what we're now going to do is apply a similar argument to the next two terms. You find their little common factor and you multiply and you subtract and you'll get the following result. Again, an S23, so let's make sure 
we get this right, s23 times the magnitude of s12 squared minus magnitude of s34 squared also equal to zero. Okay, so the implication is that I have some options here. So the argument says I, I can either force these guys to be equal or I can just set this term here to be equal uh, and, and that guy to be equal as well. And then I get some simplifications, right? <clears throat> so suppose just hypothetically I pick S14 is equal to zero and then I'm going to impose S23 is equal to zero. So these can sort of do whatever they want, but this term here has to be zero out front in order to make this true. So what that means is you go back to this original equation here, you notice this S14, whoops, excuse me, you go back to these equations here, this S14 here has to be zero, which means now this summation comes out to a one. And then I've also imposed S23. So that means this guy here also has to become zero. Right, and you can follow a similar argument to a couple more terms. And because remember, S14, that guy here is also, that guy has to be zero as well because it's the same here. And then I have an S23. So these, two, these terms appear twice or once in two equations here. So we'll write that out. So that's zero, 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 zero. And you get the following result here. And it looks like this, S12 squared plus the magnitude of uh, S13 squared is equal to one. And then I'm going to get S12 squared plus the magnitude of S24, that's at three squared is equal to one. And then I will get magnitude S13 squared plus magnitude of S34 squared is equal to one. And then I will get magnitude of S42 or same as 24, they're, they're identical, plus a magnitude of S34 squared equals one. So remember right now the order of these indices does not matter because everything is reciprocal. Okay, so this, this bunch of equations has simplified significantly by imposing that condition. Okay, so I've rewritten my four uh, equations here. And what we're gonna do is just do a little bit more investigation by first noticing that I have a bunch of like terms here. So what I'm gonna do real fast is subtract, say the second term from this term here. And you find that the magnitude of S13 squared minus the magnitude of S24 squared is equal to zero, which in turn implies that the magnitude of S13 is equal to the magnitude of S24. So you just rearrange and take the square root and that just falls right out. If you then follow a similar argument on a couple more of these terms, you find something like the following where the magnitude of S12 is equal to the magnitude of S34. So their magnitudes have to be the same, but they may have some phase differences here. So what I'm gonna do is say, rewrite these two terms over here, S12 and S34. So I'm gonna have something like alpha e to the j, let's call this, um, I don't know, theta one is equal to alpha e to the j theta two here, right? So that's my uh, S12 here, or sorry, this will be my S13 here. So call that S13 and this will be my S24 or no, excuse me, I was right the first time, that's S12. Just got a little typo in my notes there. And then this is S34 uh, over here, <clears throat> okay? And then by a similar argument, if I uh, rewrite these guys as same magnitude but a different phase, I'll get a beta e to the j phi one is equal to a beta e to the j phi two. So that is my S13 and this is my S24. So they have the same magnitude but different phase. So next, the textbook gives an interesting argument by saying that these phase offsets are kind of arbitrary, right? So in other words, I have this four port network here and I'd have the liberty to kind of just add or subtract lengths of cables on these lines. And that means I can sort of arbitrarily adjust the phase offsets on these various S parameters by simply just adding or subtracting the appropriate amount of phase. So just sort of for the, the sake of argument and convenience, I am free to basically choose three out of these four phases according to the, the argument in the text. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just choose our lengths of cables and our phases just for pure convenience. So remember the reality is there may still be in fact some phases out here, but if we, for the sake of argument and understanding the nature of the coupler, it is just convenient to decide appropriate lengths to make some of the math simplify here. So what I'm going to do is set theta one and theta two to zero so that I get essentially S12 is equal to S34, which is equal to alpha. But I'm gonna leave these two phases as different values. So I'm gonna get an S13 uh, is equal to, uh, sorry, beta e to the, so the book calls it just theta here. And then I'll have uh, S24 is equal to beta e to the j phi. So I'm gonna allow these phases to be different, but I'm equating these two phases together for the sake of foresight and convenience. So the next question is, what happens at this point? Well, I've made a whole bunch of simplifications. So I'm gonna rewrite my matrix in a second here, uh, but there, there are two possibilities that kind of fall out uh, when you impose this condition. So we got one more short little step, and that is basically, I think it's this expression here. Yeah, this guy here we're gonna look at. Uh, so I have S12, S13. So S12, S13, and there's an S24 and an S34 in here that I care about. So let's rewrite that equation over here. So S12 conjugate S13 plus S24 conjugate times S34 is equal to zero. So again, this has to be satisfied because of my lossless condition. And these were some other uh, conditions that kind of fell out and we made a few adjustments to our phase. So let's see what happens when we plug this into here. So I've got S12 conjugate, that's just alpha. S13 becomes beta e to the j theta. And then plus S24 conjugate, so that's a beta e to the minus j phi. So I hope you can read that, it's a little small. Uh, and then S34 is an alpha there, equals zero, okay? <clears throat> so I'm gonna divide my terms a bit and you basically get e to the j theta plus e to the minus j phi is equal to zero, which implies e to the j theta is equal to e to the, to the minus j phi. Okay, so sorry, I had to do a little cut there because I made a mistake. Uh, so this, we're back here at this expression and this is going to imply e to the j theta is equal to negative e to the negative j phi. So that negative there is negative one, which we can write as e to the minus j phi times e to the uh, j pi. And in fact, that j pi can also just be e to the j 2n pi after that, right? <laughs> um, because that term uh, will just be any arbitrary phase. But um, so the idea is you, you essentially you, you match the phases and you get theta plus phi is equal to pi plus 2n pi like that. Or you could say uh, 2n plus 1 times pi. Okay, um, so in practice, you're not really gonna have you know this huge amount of phase because that's just gonna amount to just extra lengths of traces in your boards. Um, so ideally, you'll probably adjust your lengths so that I don't have like this huge phase addition here from all of these extra um, <laughs> extra values going on. Um, but the idea is I have two equations here with one unknown, so there's kind of this infinite multitude of possibilities that will satisfy this equation. Um, so what the book does is it makes this argument that says, yeah, just because there's, there's infinitely many solutions to this, um, we're going to basically say, let's suppose n equals zero, right? So that's just going to be pi. And there are two cases that are common in the sense that they're, they're popular and useful. So what you'll have is case number one will be uh, theta is equal to phi, which is equal to pi over two. So that's uh, solution number one that is popular. And another option that is relatively popular is to say theta equals zero and then just let phi equal pi. Okay, so that's solution number two. So again, there's an infinite number of possibilities. These are the ones that are interesting and useful. <laughs> okay, um, so this one is called a symmetric coupler. Symmetric coupler. And this one over here is called an anti-symmetric coupler. 
over here. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is uh, fill out the S matrix, uh, S matrix for each condition here. So we'll just write this here. Here is number one, the symmetric coupler will give me an S matrix that kind of looks like the following. So this is now plugging in all of our solutions here. So all my diagonals were zero because we imposed the matching condition. So I get zero, 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 and I'll get an alpha, alpha, in fact, uh, I'll have a bunch of zeros in the center here and on the corners like that. Then you'll get a J beta, J beta, alpha, alpha, J beta, and a J beta like so. So that's the symmetric case for the uh, directional coupler here. And then option number two, we'll just kind of write it over here. You get something very, very similar, except all of these J betas um, get tweaked a little bit. So I'll get a bunch of zeros on my main diagonal again. Uh, my alphas aren't going to change, so I'll get an alpha and an alpha like that. And then what you'll find is beta, we'll put all my zeros in here, uh, and then I'll get a beta here, and this becomes negative beta and negative beta up there. <clears throat> so remember, that there are infinitely many possibilities. These are the two that are, I guess you could say, they're widely considered to be interesting. Uh, so let's visualize kind of what this entails here. So what I'm going to do is draw another four port network like the following. And what you do is you imagine a signal coming in here, say from port number one, what happens at these other ports? Uh, so you follow here, if I have a signal at port one, then port number two will have something coming out here and that'll be alpha and then port number three We'll have a signal coming out here and this will either be the the j beta for case number one or it'll just be a beta for case number two so what you do is you draw something kind of like this where a signal comes in and then another signal comes down and around that way so that's why it's called a directional coupler that a signal will come in here and <clears throat> uh, you get energy coming out here and nothing comes out of this port but it is reciprocal, so the same thing kind of happens in the opposite direction, where a signal might come in here, and then I'll get two signals kind of coming out with a little bit bleeding off the other side, but nothing comes out this way. So you can see how this is actually pretty useful for both transmitting and receiving kind of at the same time, because any signal transmitting out here will do nothing to this port over here, but only the signals coming back will uh, give me some non-zero energy out here. All right, so that, that idea of I can receive a signal here and the transmission signal over here will not corrupt it. So that's one of the major values of a directional coupler. Okay, so there are some terminologies here. We'll call this the input port over here. This is the isolated over here. This guy here is called the through port uh, over here. And then this guy is the coupled port over here. Okay, so <clears throat> what you do now is you want to quantify the properties of your directional coupler using some terminology. So we'll have what is called the coupling factor, which is defined as uh, C, which is 10 times the log base 10 of uh, your, your power coming out of port 3, or you have the, the power going in, then power kind of coming out here. So it's P1 over P3, which we would write as... Uh, Sorry, I'm falling off my page here. Negative 20 log 10 of beta. Okay, and then you know, I guess you know, we can just look to the book here. So you have the directivity now, which you'll notice is three over four, Oops, excuse me. So if we look at that guy and then we'll have isolation and insertion. So let, let's kind of just go through them one by one. So coupling, you notice is power comes in and then some power comes out and I wanna know that ratio there. Uh, then you have directivity. So I'm going to define D, the directivity, so I don't have quite as much room as I would like. So uh, log 10 of P3, whoops, sorry, P3 divided by P4. Okay, so I have some power coming out here, and there's some power here, which you'll notice this becomes um, 20 times the log of beta divided by S14. So ideally, 
S14 should be zero, but in practice, it, it will never actually be perfectly zero. Uh, so the idea is I have some power here and there's something getting over here. And ideally there should be nothing coming out here. So the directivity should in principle be infinite, uh, but there will be some leakage coming out here, which I don't like and I want to quantify that. <clears throat> so that's called the directivity D. Then I have isolation I, which is defined as 10 times log 10. So uh, let's see, uh, P1 over P4. So again, ideally infinite isolation should mean no power coming out of this port here, but that, that doesn't really happen in practice, but it's probably not uncommon to see values on the scale of like 60 to 80 dB with this sort of thing. <laughs> so that is uh, 20 times the log 10. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of running out here of magnitude of S14 in decibels, or you could say 10 log 10 of S14 squared, that works as well. And then finally, there's the insertion loss, which we'll call IL, or simply L, which is defined as 10 log 10 of, what is this, P1 over P2, which is negative 20 log 10 of magnitude of S12 dB. So insertion loss is basically I send in a bunch of power here and a bunch comes out here and what's kind of the difference. So ideally, you know, in an ideal sense, I would want um, the only problem would be I have power here and most of it should come out here and maybe some should come out over here. Um, and I can tweak these ratios in principle. So you see I, I'm inserting energy. Some of it comes out here, but I lose a little bit out to my port number three. So insertion loss, okay, that's, that's kind of the way to think about it. All right, so that, that was a little bit mathematically hectic. So let's just kind of review that real quick, just to make sure we emphasize all the main points. So we started by imagining a four port network and we imposed the condition of being matched and reciprocal and lossless. So that imposed all these goofy equations here. And we did a whole bunch of mixing and matching between them. And what we found was that our solutions had to sort of look like this, okay? We had many options for our phases over here and we just kind of picked out the two that were most popular. And what you find is you get the situation where power can come here and then fall out the other two, um, but nothing kind of out this port over here. And it, the reciprocity also means that if I inject power over here, you'll see the same thing kind of happening in reverse, right? So it is matched reciprocal and lossless. And we had these four parameters that we used to define kind of the performance of a directional coupler. So, so if that handwriting is too nasty, just remember it's right here in your book. You have the coupling, the directivity, the isolation and insertion loss. And each one is a very useful parameter. Uh, the sort of thing you would read on a data sheet when you're trying to buy a directional coupler off the shelf. Okay, so you see that the, the notion of this directional coupling effect is a perfectly natural, uh, mathematical result of imposing those three conditions all at once. This is the only thing that can simultaneously satisfy those three conditions of being matched and reciprocal and lossless. Okay, so that is sort of the theoretical uh, essence of the directional coupler. And we'll do some kind of uh, investigation on what does one something like this look like in practice later on. Uh, but first we're gonna do the the power divider, the Wilkinson power divider, and then uh, the couplers will come in your book after that a little bit shortly. So just the organization of the book is a little interesting where they introduce the theory of it first and then they kind of jump back to some practical ideas and then we'll eventually get to how do you make something like this yourself. Okay, so there you go. 